Good evening and welcome to this evening's webinar, uh, part of the Texas Instruments 2015 webinar series. This evening's webinar being a self-paced learning with TI Inspire. My name is Brian Lannan, I'm your host for this evening. And uh, let uh, me tell you just about a couple of other things. At the end of this, you, uh, oh, the webinar is being recorded, um, um, but after the webinar, you may log into the webinar section of the Texas Instruments website where you can actually download the recording to play it back at your leisure. Um, you can also download any files that our two presenters this evening choose to upload for you to use. Um, and you also get a lovely um, uh, certificate, participation certificate. Let me tell you about your presenters. Uh, John Baymet is has been a, a T-Cube trainer for quite a few years now. Uh, he teaches at O'Loughlin Catholic College, and that is in Darwin. John describes himself as a technology fanatic, which of course I hope we all are. Um, and I've worked with John before, and he's got some great ideas for, as he mentions here, both calculator platforms for TI Inspire and the TI-84. You're in for a treat tonight. Uh, Jim Lowe uh, is a research associate at the Queensland University of Technology that's in Brisbane. Um, and you see here a picture of the Dreamworld roller coaster. Jim uh, has been instrumental in establishing the data logging experience at Dreamworld. And guess what? I w was fortunate a few years back to be a guest on one of his trips where he strapped data logging equipment to us in a jacket and threw us around the roller coaster just to check out the G-forces. Um, can I just, uh, I'll hand you over to your host shortly, but can I remind you that during the webinar, you are really, really encouraged to type in your questions and chat. That's the advantage of doing this thing live. Um, you can use either of those boxes. Probably chat is the easiest. Can I recommend that you type not just to the host, but um, to all panellists. That way we'll all get it and you get more of a chance of having your question answered. Um, so really encouraging the, the questions. If you do switch applications during the webinar, um, do your um, alt tab or however you drive your computer to find that little blue and green ball. That's the Cisco WebEx um, webinar symbol. If you click on that, then you will be back into the viewing what is uh, being transmitted for the webinar. After the webinar, there's a few more things, um, but I'll talk to you about that after the webinar. Enjoy. Well, good evening, folks. Jim Lowe here, starting off this session this evening. Whoops, and we've gone straight away into the wrong bit. But okay, I hope everybody can see my screen now, and let's have a look at this presentation. So tonight we're talking about self-paced learning with the, the TI Inspire. Um, I guess the first thing we should do is have a look at what exactly do we mean by self-paced learning. And I've put a few points there, but it's a, by no means an exhaustive list. Over the years, people have thought of self-paced learning as maybe some sort of graded practice exercises. They might be guided tasks where we scaffold the students through to reach a particular result. We might extend the concept to uh, self-directed learning and lead into open-ended tasks. And then we might look at some of the things that we're going to do tonight, which is all of that and a few other variations and twists to go along with it. Um, I'm not sure of the uh, experience of those uh, participants in the webinar tonight, so we're going to have a look at a few activities and along the way, for one of them at least, I'm going to attempt to show you how to create a little self-correcting practice exercise for the students and we'll see how we go. Um, 
We asked the second question, why do we need self-paced learning? Well, I think everybody in a classroom today has been uh, informed about the need for differentiated instruction and catering to the needs of all students, uh, of allowing students to interact with the material at the level that they're at. Uh, we've got classrooms today with even more diverse interests, I think, than we ever had. We're trying to encourage students to take responsibility for their own learning, and we want to engage students with the, the latest things. So uh, that's just about it for the PowerPoint. I'm going to have a look at a, a few activities, not all of these tonight, but um, we'll have a look at a few. So let's get out of the PowerPoint and into our Inspire and have a look at this um, first activity. And you can see here, it's a pretty typical example, and we've got it set up um, that if you click this new button, you get new activities or new expressions to factorize, and we can turn the answers on and off for the students to have a look at them. So that's a pretty straightforward one. Um, but it's something that I've used for years and years since this, I've had the Inspire um, that I, I keep telling my students, they say, oh, I need some more work to practice this. Well, well, let's set it up because you've got an infinite supply and we'll look at how to create one of these later on this evening. But, um, you know, you can, that's fairly basic quadratics to um, factorize, we can increase the complexity somewhat by throwing in a negative factor and then we can throw in, I hope we can throw in, no, maybe we've got to go further, there we go. We throw in a few coefficients and there's a bit of funny formatting happening there with decimal values appearing there. Um, but I just want to show you something to, to point out how random and unlimited these are, that the slider goes up to 10, and take a note of that expression there, um, 3x squared minus 12x plus 9, I go back to that one, if I go back to 10, it's a totally different expression, so I could even just have two values in that slider that I'm clicking on there and so on, and um, I can click on them to get the answer and of course you might realize that the way we always get the expressions to factorize is that we start with um, the answer and then expand it to get something the expression there anyway as I said that's pretty um, straightforward in some ways and one of the things that I've been doing in the the work here at that I've been involved in at QUT for the last 12 months is looking for ways to uh, extend students and extend them in different ways. And I saw this activity and I saw it in a publication somewhere and it was just a printed copy and it had four expressions and it said do this. And my first thought was, well, one's good, but if I had lots of them, it would be even better. So we created this task here. So if we had a a face-to-face -face workshop, I would have given you time at this stage to take a copy of those four expressions that you can see and form an equation by taking pairs of those expressions linking them together with an equal sign and solve the equation. And as you can see, we click on that and we get a new set of expressions and a new set of equations that can be formed from that. And you might say, so what's different from the quadratic? They were factorizing, this is solving equations, it's a routine algorithmic task, and it's great for those kids in our class that need that practice. So um, what's special? Why the name Mysterious Links? And that's why it would have been so important to actually get you to solve the equations, because if you solve these equations, the solution will come out to be you get six 
uh, equations from pairing the expressions up and the solutions will turn out to be x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And if you get another set of expressions, the solutions will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And so on we go. And what I was hoping for here is that if we're doing this in class, that a bright spark is going to um, quickly um, catch on to the fact that they're always going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And so there's the um, extension task immediately that you ask them why. Can you find out why that would be? Or you ask them to, well, you make me a set of equations or a set of expressions that will give me solutions 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. And how we created that is, is almost a lesson in itself, because how do we create these expressions, two expressions, and actually a set of expressions with uh, particular solutions, and we get into the whole nature of equality. And how do we get, how do we transform, for example, 5x into 2x plus 9 to make it an equation? And if we want those to be equal, what we've got to add on is zero. We're back into the principles of addition and equality that the, you add the additive identity of zero. And if you took those um, two expressions and equated them, you'd see that we get an answer of x equals 3. The top line's always going to be x equals 3 because we add on an expression that is actually 0 when x equals 3. And that's what we've done all through that. So at the end of the session, uh, I'll be sending these to, to Brian or Peter or Daisy, whoever, to put up on the website so that you can have a play around with this. It's just a um, series of maths boxes. And just for a bit of fun, um, for the student that thinks he knows what's going on, there's a second set there that if you solve these, the solutions will be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and so on. And so we then said, well, if we can do that, We'll jump to the next stage, and the solutions would actually be, um, in this case, uh, a set of solutions that would start with 2, and each one would decrease by negative 5. So we've actually made up a set of an equations where the six solutions are form an arithmetic progression. So that in terms of a self-paced thing that a student that's working through this, if they got as far as the third one, and we started them off just solving simple equations in, say, year eight or nine or something like that, I think we have a potential genius on our hand. But they can get there if they like. So just to explain how that one works, um, well, I've got another one that's along the same lines and is actually called random fractions. And here we've created three random numbers, same deal. The students um, make all possible fractions from those, and then they have to practice adding them together. And if they add them all together, then um, you actually find that, um, let me show you this one so you can see the fractions. What's happening there? Let's see the sum. Uh, what's happened here? That's the wrong part of the screen. There we go. And the product. So that it doesn't matter what numbers are generated there, you might see a little twist there in the numbers, how they've been created. Um, they form the six possible fractions that they can get from that. And if they add them all together, it'll always be negative 3. So there's a little twist for the kids there to actually um, work out how to do that. Now, I'm very conscious of the time. Um, I'm just looking at this one here and was actually going to show you how to do that. And there's our three random numbers. So we just typed the, sorry, start again, the split screen. Here we've got a notes page. So you can see you've got the math boxes up there. And we've got A is 10, um, B is, or negative B is that, and C we just get there. So we type in this, or we create this slider that we've called new in this case. We type in a text statement 
and it's simply we can use any of the maths commands available to us. So I wanted a random integer between 2 and 10 and plus new minus new. And then you can click on that and say calculate that. It'll ask us do you want to use um, the variable new s. So I will say yes to that and there's another value there. And that's what I did before, clicked on that, made it calculate it, get a value and then stored that value in A. Did it a second time, store that value in B. Here's a third time, I don't really want it to do anything but I'm going to say store that in um, oh, T. I don't think I've used T anywhere in here and so forth and that would be stored in T. And having done that, I can go back up in here to my maths box and use that anywhere I like so that, um, let's get this cursor over here, um, enter a maths box, let's just put in um, T plus 2 for the sake, whoops, T plus 2 and we get 6. But the thing is that every time I click on this slider, because those values are generated from that statement that uses new and new has changed, then all of those values are going to change. So that's how you get your uh, unlimited set of random values and combinations. You just build up the expressions you need for the problem that you're using. And as I said, I've been looking for ones that I can build with that little twist, like the fractions all add up to negative 3 or the equations have particular solutions so that I have something in there to extend the student. So I think that's the end of the um, first part that I'm going to talk about and uh, we'll get ready to hand over to um, John for his segment. Clever stuff, Tim. 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 Sorry, Brian. We've got uh, John's screen coming up shortly. Thanks, uh, Jim. I thought um, it's always nice to be using those sh sliders and, and use the variables like you do. I think it's fantastic and, and being able to regularly change the random number um, is priceless. And like you said, with the self-paced approach, either the students may only sort of start accessing it at the uh, sort of trying to work out the pattern and what the rule is, but then like you said, other students may be coming up with their own um, set of equations or sort of expressions, sorry. Um, but also even perhaps trying to do what you created on their own piece of software. Yeah, guys, I remember many years ago doing similar things uh, on a spreadsheet um, and all sorts of convoluted formulas and it, um, it's so much easier to just have it all on the one platform here. Easy yeah, to use. Indeed. Now, John, I'm not yeah. seeing your screen yet. Uh, I do apologise about that. I was so excited with, um, with Brian's <laughs> that, with, um, Jim, sorry, that I didn't forget to click that button, so thank you for that. There we go, how's that? That's looking much better. There we go. <laughs> oh, I just didn't join myself too much. Um, okay, good evening all, um, and welcome from, from, to, from myself, John, um, up in sunny Darwin. And uh, I'd like to continue with the, the idea of the self-paced approach for our students. Um, but as, as for us, as teachers, if we want to do these activities that are self-paced, uh, then we need to have the resources that are available to us. Um, and that's where the TI Australia website comes in. There's plenty of activities on this website, uh, many different places, and I know that this is being upgraded, um, how we find them and how they're, they're filtered at the moment, but um, one of the ways that hopefully that you all are aware is to go into downloads, to go into activities, Go into activities on get ready. There we go. And you can either choose by subject, by keyword, uh, advanced search you would use if you're wanting to use um, different uh, probes with your calculator um, or different um, yeah, aspects like that. But you can also see there's links to the webinars for the on demand and the live ones, but also links to the science inspired and the IB aligned resources um, and 
I'll we'll just go back to the main screen. We can see here that one of the newer tabs um, that we have here is the Australian curriculum. So if I click on that. So in these activities in total, there's about 200 activities. Um, about 50 of these are selected or aimed specifically to CI Inspire. And there's about 26 of these that are linked at the current stage to the Australian curriculum years 7 to 10A. Um, and there also will be a senior curriculum site available in December, which I'm looking very much forward to. Um, but for now, I'd like to focus on the Australian curriculum. And, and an activity I ran earlier this year was with my year 7. So I'll click on the year 7 activity. Uh, there's a few here that you can have a look at. Um, and I was using number. I have to click on it here on the side. And, and here's the one I was looking at. Factors that count. Now we can see that on this site it gives us uh, the link to the objectives for the Australian curriculum and the resources that are available to us for this one. Uh, there's a PDF document for the students, there's a notes page for the teachers, and QE, always nice to have, uh, is an answer sheet as well. Uh, so when I did this activity, um, and I started it off with uh, a YouTube clip, and one of one of the sites that I quite enjoy using uh, is by Number5. And those are videos in the main done by Dr. James Grimes um, in the UK. And so for me, they set, they set the scene for my students, and it also piqued their interest. And the one that I was looking at was this one here, uh, which was encryption and huge numbers. Uh, and this is a fantastic video. Um, and not only were the students then able to work through the activity at their own pace, but they're able to watch the videos as many times as they like, really, as well as showing it to their parents and siblings, and therefore developing further mathematical interest and discussion outside of the classroom, which to me is really important. Um, I regularly keep in touch with my parents via email, um, and having this discussion outside of the classroom, and discussing what they're doing in class with their parents, to me is really important. Also, it then led my students to look at other videos, mathematics videos, and especially other number file videos. Um, so these activities all can be used by the classroom teacher, or they can also be set as relief lessons. Now, to download these files, you can see here we just download them as a zip file. We can then open these up, and I just save them to my documents here. And we can see here is the technology, uh, the activity sheet already for our students. It leads them nicely through it, gives them some advice on what to do. And as I said to you, we also have the teacher's notes. And this is what I was saying, that maybe you may want to use it yourself, or at times for a relief lesson, or um, a lesson with um, maybe an extra teacher who's, who's taking a group of students off, may want to work through this, has got some ideas on what to do on the way to lead it for the students. Now, I think for me, for this section, I wanted to introduce you to this site, where some of the activities are. Um, and in the next section, I'm going to show some more specific ones um, and how they can be used both on the handheld, on the desktop, but also um, on the iPad. Jim, was there anything else you wanted to add to that? I'll happily add more to it. No, sorry, I've got another little bit. I was just trying to find another file there to get ready for it, yeah. Yeah, John, I reckon that sort of stuff's absolutely superb. And I think if teachers haven't found their way to the um, Australian Curriculum Inspired uh, page yet, then uh, I think they're, they're really missing out because there's so many great activities there uh, and time-saving stuff. Um, at my school, we, we book list Inspire from Year 10, but with the amount of activities that are coming on there from you know, further down the curriculum from Year 7, um, you know, just look at the the Tower of Hanoi problem there. There's so much great maths in that. 
and with accompanying worksheets. So how easy is that? Print it off, give it to the students. Yeah. It really, like I said, I know that, like you said, the Towers of Hanoi has been around for a while, um, as we all know. But um, like I said, having the worksheet and these documents already made, both, uh, and I'll show you later, the TNS files, but also uh, so the, um, the backing documents to support the teachers um, and worksheets for the students, it makes the teachers' life so much easier. Um, yeah. And with that, things like this one especially, um, and the use of the iPads, um, like you said, the, the middle school students can, can really sort of almost feel the maths that they're doing when they actually grab those blocks and move them with their fingers. Um, I think to some extent that's in conjunction with actually having the, the actual object, if you can, um, having some you know, real concrete uh, materials in your classroom. But um, this definitely um, develops their understanding further. And, and like Jim said at the start, it allows them to be very much uh, individualized. Um, they can work through it um, at the literally, as we're trying to say, at their own pace. Yeah, I, I totally agree that uh, concrete manipulatives still need to be in there. Um, so whether the kids have the blocks or, or coins or whatever they're using um, to initially investigate the problem, but it's not long before they realise we need to speed this up to actually get more data, and so some sort of computer application. And uh, as you say, this this particular activity is absolutely terrific on the iPad, where mm. you move the discs by touching it, touching and dragging. It's lovely. Yeah. So, Brian, so Jim, have you found you. the file you're after? Uh, Jim, sorry. Yeah, we're good to go, mate. Yes. Okay, Jim, you're you're on. Okay, so desktop should be coming up, and it's of course hitting the wrong one. So let's go there, and let's go to something a little bit. Uh, different. Uh, this one is very, very much unstructured. Um, getting to the last of some of the options that I said there where we had uh, self-directed open-ended tasks that were used to act as a, as a stimulus. And this is one uh, activity that uh, I first saw presented this year, earlier this year when I was lucky enough to attend the T-Cube conference in Fort Worth. And the couple of activities that were presented during that session uh, intrigued me. And there was a comment made during the session that uh, somebody asked, where do you find your inspiration for these activities? And the presenter at the time said, oh, you know, you just general reading and you find something and so on. And somebody in the audience piped up and said, the Penguin Dictionary of Curious and Interesting Geometries. And that intrigued me. And so when I got home, I went searching on the web for the Penguin Dictionary of Curious and Interesting Geometries. and found a copy on Amazon. It's long since out of print. It's not the most exciting document, um, but I think I picked up a second-hand copy on Amazon for about $6.50 or something like that, and then paid about three times as much for postage to get it sent to Australia. But it was still a, a cheap book because it was in great condition. And it's just got a whole host of these, and so far I've made about a dozen of these sort of activities where you present a geometrical type situation and then allow the kids to investigate. And this one that we've got here tonight is called Simpsons Line. And you can jump on the web and search for Simpsons Line and you will find all sorts of things uh, about Simpson, and the, sometimes called the Simpson-Wallace Line. Uh, and it has no relation to Homer Simpson for the kids, but they, at least it makes their ears prick up and pay attention for a little while. Um, you can even find an animation on there, and um, 
There's no audio to this one. I'm just going to play a little bit of it and see what happens. And you can see that it's got a triangle and we've created some lines and I'll talk about what they are in a moment. And there's Simpson's line. And in a moment they're going to start animating it and that's about all I'm going to let you see. You can search for that on YouTube and go for that yourself. And so our task was to uh, create that ourselves. And it's one of those tasks that you can either give it to the kids as I've got it here as a TNS file and let them explore, or you can give them the definition and um, allow them to work out how to construct that. And the definition is pretty simple. We've got a triangle, A, uh, should be A, B, C, but somehow B's got itself stuck way out there that should be over there. And um, we've got A, B, and C are all points on a circle. And P is another point on the circle. And all that we've done there is constructed the perpendicular from P to either the sides of the triangle or to the side extended. And what you notice, what the kids notice is that it appears that, especially as we've drawn a line called through it and called it Simpson's line, that those three points are collinear. And we can, of course, um, with the power of the Inspire and the geometry, uh, move that around and see that it seems to be fairly constant, or it's always the case, and we can move the points on the triangle around and see what happens there, and that it doesn't matter what triangle it is, we can drag them around there, just any three points on the triangle, and we can even go and animate it. And so we've actually recreated in some ways, it's maybe not as fancy as that um, little YouTube clip that we saw there. The YouTube clip, by the way, goes into a whole lot more things and so on, but we were just going to investigate um, Simpson's line. And we, as I said, you could give this to the kids um, in all sorts of um, different formats. As I said, the prepared TNS or just a description and create it on their own, or you could go and actually recreate it, but this time with the graphing axes there and so on, and start to get them to um, actually work out the equations. And um, I actually did an exercise with some students with this, and it's, it's a topic that we could get into for a webinar even on its own right, and that is using the power of the CAS. We can move this thing around. We can move this point around, no problems. We can move it around, get all these problems, but until we actually do a mathematical proof, um, how do we know that it works for all possible triangles, all possible points, and all possible circles? And so we can actually use the CAS, and I set it up this way as an interim step where we had um, the circle, to make it a little bit easier, I moved it onto the origin. We've got points on there, and we could work it through. But the kids I was working with, I was trying to point out to them that, you know, they you ask them, how I can't prove that, they say. You know, you say, prove that it's, it's a straight line. I can't prove that. But this is what I see is one of the fundamentals of self-paced learning. They need time to go and attack that and show themselves that they can. And along the way, we might do some judicious prompting to remind them. And all I did with this group of kids is just remind them, what am I asking you to do? Show that three points are collinear. Now, just about every year 11 maths course in the country, if not earlier, 
would have exercises that require kids to do that. What's different about this is that I'm not giving you any coordinates, so you've got to work back and say, how do I get coordinates? Well, it's the intersection of a line and um, a perpendicular. So it's a perpendicular from point P, for example, to the equation of BC. Well, before I can find the intersection, I need the equation of that line. And all of those things that kids can do, but they just look at the task initially and put their hands up, and so you just prompt and let them work through it at their own pace. And what we did in this one is, I don't know if this was actually finished or not, but they can use the CAS to keep the algebra simple. And that was another thing that I learned going to, to TQ, that we work out the coordinates of M1, and we've stored it in a variable called M1x and M1y. And to get the equation of BC, then, okay, it's y minus these things and so forth. We can solve for the intersection, or we solve that to put it in the form y, and we store it as the equation of BC. And so I'm not going into it now because it's not the purpose of this webinar, but we can actually get the kids to structure their proof by just, you can save the whole equation. So they, don't, they just need the equation of BC. And so um, later on, um, they can come down here and solve the equation of BC um, with the equation of PBC and so forth and find XY and yeah, we did something wrong there. Uh, set it up better here with the students and so we got the results. And those values we can store into a variable so that when we use it, um, so it just makes it easier for the students to do that. And actually they get a real big kick out of it um, if they can actually get through and solve it and show that it is in fact um, a straight line. And then it's really a simple matter to recreate that instead of using actual coordinates, just put x1, y1, x2, y2, y, x3, y3, and so on. And again, use the CAS to just work it through and keep track of the expression. So it's yet another way you can allow the students to pace themselves through and keep track of what could be um, a fairly lengthy and a task that most of them would balk at. And one of the comments I hear, I heard it just this afternoon when I was visiting a school before this, the teacher, the head of the department actually said, what we want to do is get the kids to persevere. And to me that's tied up with this whole idea of self-pacing. We need to let them work through it and support them with tools like the CAS so that they can get to the end and get a result. And if they to get a result with one task, they're prepared to um, take on the, the next one with a little bit more enthusiasm. And again, we've still got the tools to support them. Um, and so apart from this one, this Simpsons line, as I said, I got about a dozen of these made with all sorts of things. And my task, I guess, if anybody's desperate for them, drop me an email and I'll bundle them up and send them because at the moment they're all just like this. Um, they've been created, but I need to do some writing and some notes to go with them. Or if anybody wants to take on the task and write the notes to go with them, you can do that too. But on that point, um, I would um, open it up for comments from the others or pass it on to John for the, the next stage of what he wants to show us. Jim, I think um, the nice point that he made at the end there is that if teachers do have any of these resources like this, I'm sure that TI would be more than willing to look at them and potentially have them uploaded onto the site as well for other teachers to share and, and actually use. Agreed. Yeah, I, I, I don't have too many activities up there because I tend to operate this way that I just create something and work it through with the kids and I never follow through and uh, actually document it so that it, somebody can pick it up without sort of explanation. but. Um, it's a goal I'm setting myself. The nice idea, mm. though, is that, um, it gives people ideas of, you know, gives them some ideas of what they could do and how, um, how especially the CAS could be used. 
Um, and I think the other point that you made um, about giving students time, I think, is really key. Um, I know they're all under time pressure, um, but students sort of always want that quick fix, that quick, quick answer. And I think that given activities like this where it takes them a bit longer and they've got to work their way through it, it's good practice and it's good experience for them uh, when they get into the senior years of study and, and then on to university as well. Oh, totally agree. And, you know, there's research out there that shows that the, the average kids in maths classes, uh, senior maths classes, think that if they can't solve it in five minutes, then they can't do it and they give up and so forth. And as maths teachers, we know that it takes a lot longer than that sometimes for us to uh, work through a problem and we know that we make mistakes and you have to go back. And that's one of the things that uh, I like about using the CAS in this sort of way, that you've actually got a track of what it is that you're doing. And if it comes down to the end and you find that, oh, I didn't prove these three points are collinear, but I know they should be, then you can go back through and see that, ah, used the wrong point back here in step four or something like that. And you just copy it, edit it, then you've got the correct result, then you substitute that back into where it's required in the, the next part of your your proof or your calculation. And so, you, you know, you get it, making an error doesn't mean that you have to go right back to the start and do it all again and so forth. So I think it's really um, powerful. Right. Yeah, the well, perseverance thanks. is an important thing. <coughs> Excuse me, but um, one of the one of the particularly great features of an activity like that is the the multi leveling of it. It um, you know to obviously take it as far as the proof is it's a lot more than uh, just watching say a little YouTube clip. Yeah, or, or and doing you know, the so the, themselves, yeah. there's some kids that again they just get the practice of here's a point, here's a line find the equation of the perpendicular, right? Um, find the point of intersection. They're all sort of routine things that we do in class, but to me, um, putting them in this sort of construct gives the kids a little bit of um, purpose, a little bit of uh, encouragement or um, prodding to want to do it. I want to see if this thing actually yeah. works and so forth. You know, rather than just, why did I find the equation of this perpendicular? Oh, because it was question 42 in this exercise sort of thing, you know? It's, um, they're just, yeah, I'm a big believer in kids having a, a reason to do their mathematics. Yeah. John's found your book. Oh, did you? Yeah. I, uh, it's I not the greatest reason to... in the world, but it's got lots of things in there. Yeah, that's great, Jim. Thanks very much for that. Okay, so Brian, obviously you can see my screen, I'll continue. Yes. Oh, I want you to read good, that yes. to us. Right, thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to use and, and share my um, iPad just for a little bit. Um, so this is the non-CAS version of the Enquire that's on my iPad. And I thought it was just worth mentioning that um, the some of the activities and some of the CNS files only work um, with CAS, like Jim's already mentioned that already about how it runs in the background. Here's an example. This is a year seven activity uh, called Mental Maths. Um, and you can see that when we do go to the next page, that there's errors being caused on this page. Uh, and those errors shouldn't be there. Um, but obviously, because this is the non-CAS version, it's actually being affected by this. So for, us not, for that not to occur, just be mindful of that when you do go to different activities, here's the same activity again down here. Uh, this time on the CAS version, the first page is exactly the same. And you can now see that this one can be adjusted and it works, it works smoothly. Um, and this is one of the activities on the, the TI website, um, but also gives you examples um, and worksheets that go along with it. I just thought that was just worth bearing in mind. Um, okay. Also, with some of the more recent activities, oh, let me go to here. I think I put it on here. Here we go. Like this one here, called slope fields and differential equations, which really is mainly used, um, as it says down here, um, for VCE specialist mathematics. 
Not only do we have the TNF bars, here they are, and the documents as we've talked before, uh, but on the documents, some of these have um, QR codes. And I'm just going to um, show you that for a second. Let me just get out of this. Okay, and here's the document from that there. You can see that document on my screen now. But I'm also now going to link this back with my iPad again because I do want to show you how we can then there we go. Then use QR code readers and the students I would have thought have got these on their, their devices um, so they can actually access this either as electronic copies you can see here or um, as a hard copy and there we go here is a video that runs and explains about the slope field. That is I won't very say cool. too much, and obviously now we're really soaking into my Wi-Fi use. Um, but uh, we can see how these QR codes now can be used nicely with the documents that we can hand to students, and they can can run with these as well. Okay, let's just swing that down for a minute. And John, just quickly, if we don't have a QR reader, which a lot of a lot of uh, most people would have on some device or other. Uh, am I right in thinking all we would need to do is type in the web address as it is on the worksheet? That's right, yeah. Um, obviously I can access this, um, you can see my screen, can you? Uh, I can yes. access yes. this PDF document at the moment. Um, oh, cancel. Um, but yeah, if I type that into the website then um, that also would come up that way as well. But it, it, um, a lot of our students are using these, the QR codes and it's just, um, again, uh, engaging them with the technology um, and giving them extra resources like that video to, to support them in what they're actually um, learning. So they've got the, the visual support as well as, the, um, as, well as the, the documentation and using their TI Inspires as well. All right. Yeah, the mix of resources is a great idea. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, very much so. Um, and something else I do want to show using um, the iPad again, we talked earlier about, um, hopefully it'll come back up again. Right. Now it's still here. Here it is. Um, oh, look at that. Always when you don't want it to, eh? Is it going to be okay? There we go. Also, what I was um, talking about with the iPad that I was talking about earlier was when you actually are using some of these activities. Let's right, start my changes here. Um, sorry, it's on the other one. This is an activity created by um, Steve Arnold. But again, not only does it lead us through it us on our own, um, lead the students through it on their own if they want to, to just read through it and, and understand what's going on. So this one's looking at um, creating um, a cone hat from a piece of paper. Um, it also gives them a nice, um, using the geometry side of things, gives them a nice actual visual thing. They can actually work with it get some calculations from it, um, and we can see the shape slowly change. It only changes a bit on this one because it's trying to represent the, the 3D image. Um, but we can see how students can actually work with that and get some ideas of what's going on, as well as actually, as you said earlier, Brian, getting the, the, a physical piece of paper and actually making it themselves. But on activities like this, it gives us, it gives us room. Um, so these are my additions to the sentences at the bottom. But it gives us room for the students to answer these questions. Um, and with this being self-paced, you know, the students could be doing it in class, they could be doing it um, in their study time, um, or for homework, or, or equally in their own time. But um, they could actually then answer these questions. Uh, as you can see, uh, the student John Bayman wasn't very good at answering many of these. Um, but when they've read the questions and they answer, the, answer what they are, they then um, can equally on the iPad send that back to the teacher, either using email or Edmodo or Dropbox. Um, obviously, they could print it off, 
but also they, if they're using a handheld, they could use Navigator and pass it back through that way as well. Let me get back to here. Okay. Thank you for that. There's the activity, as I said earlier, on the um, on the website that you can actually access. This leads me then on to looking at other ones that are on the Australian curriculum, not only as their activities, but there's also tests that are already made. And um, I just had to create a test last night for my year 10s on exponentials and logs, and I'd, I'd love to there have been one there. Perhaps I need to stop talking a good game and, and give it back to TI and put one on there. But um, here we can see that there's a reflections and transformations test already created. Again, down the side here is the paper copy with the answers if we need it, the teacher's notes, um, and the TNS file. Um, so when people do that on the, the iPad, it will automatically open on the, um, on the TI Inspire version. Let me just do it this way instead. We can see here it is. It opens it straight up now into my um, uh, TI Inspire on, on, my, on my handheld, oh, sorry, on my, uh, soft, uh, on my computer. Um, and the questions then are then available for the students to do this test on their own. The students then would, would highlight their answers on each of these questions. Randomly picking through. And like I said, either using Navigator, they could then, that teacher could take that back and it would self-mark it. Um, if we go into here, we can see that there are um, a self-correct thing so that when, when using Navigator, you could take it back. Or they could, again, be, be emailed back to the teacher. Um, but the way I thought that also this could be used rather than as a test um, is actually as a, a learning tool for the students themselves. Um, and they could actually make, give, the teacher can give the students access rights to these questions. So to do that, we go into tools, as I've shown you here. We go into teacher tool palette. And we go into question properties. And at the moment, it's set for exam. All right. So let me just show you what that means. When the students are using these and they're going through the questions, when they go into menu, we can see that this check answer is not available for them to do. But if we now, before we send the document to the students, whether it be as an email or a navigator or using the cables, we actually change this to self-check. And then the students get the document. The students can go through the questions on their own again. And obviously, there's an element of trust going on here. Um, students may just click one bullet point just randomly and just go and check it themselves. But um, the idea is that you're using this as a teaching tool for them. Um, so then the students, once they've chosen the one they've got, they go into menu. They can now check the answer. And ah, your current answer is incorrect. So I can either choose to show correct answer, and this is where, as I said, you'd want to educate the students on how this can be used, or you can get them to try again. Um, and again, this is developing those skills of perseverance, of checking through their answers, um, why the answer they gave isn't the right one, um, and trying to then read what it is and hopefully come up with it. And I have to confess I'm not even reading it. Ryan, are you reading it? Are you gonna, have, I, have I hit the right one? Oh. <laughs> there we go. Very good. How about that? Yep. Your current answer is the correct one. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And give me a little tick, and I can move on to the next question. So, hey, John, really where nice I can see. Sorry, Sorry. Go I was going to say where I can see this being really useful with the um, students being able to check their own answer um, is that remember, we're all playing with computers here, but students have a handheld device. Um, I mm -hmm. see this as you know, time when you're on the school bus or you're, or you're waiting or you've, you've got this portable pocket-sized tool that, uh, that you can use for doing a bit of your maths study, but maths review. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and recently with my Year 9s, um, a piece of assessment that they had to do for trigonometry uh, was quite open-ended, and, and a lot of students made their own tests up. Um, and part of the um, marking rubric was they not only had to make their own trigonometry test, but they also had to give me answers and solutions. Um, this was a great way that some of my students actually created their own trig test. Um, and by doing the sort of behind the scenes bit and, and having this section, as you can see here, where they had to actually choose the correct answer, um, you know, made these resources. And then down the line, I've now got these resources that I can use 
with uh, future years. So now it's a win-win. You get an assessment for one year and you can use it with the next. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's always interesting me. They seem to come up with uh, more challenging questions and um, um, some very, um, yeah, really insightful questions they come up with more than um, at times I can come up with. So it's fantastic. Um, and that's about it from me, I think, unless Jim would like to add anything further to that. No, I think you covered that stuff pretty much pretty well, John. Thank you, Jim. Okay, well, uh, thank you, gents, and that's just been uh, terrific. And look at the um, uh, the technologies that we've covered there. Uh, we've gone from uh, you know from the uh, Penguin Dictionary of interesting and curious geometries uh, through to um, <laughs> through to using um, yeah the air, air server to uh, to show the iPad. And I must admit, I'm getting more and more into that iPad. I, I, I like the uh, I like the tactile nature of that, of just dragging things around on, on the iPad there, um, linking through to Q, QR code readers, YouTube videos, um, you name it. Now, I did say I'd return to this uh, little slideshow before. I will to remind our people of uh, what we do after the webinar. And... Uh, I guess the main one you're going to be looking for is pretty soon you'll be getting um, you'll be you'll be getting the uh, the files the, some of these wonderful files that uh, John and Jim have prepared for you, and of course you also have the access uh, to be able to, or the ability to actually download the um, download the uh, recording of the webinar. Um, but immediately following up after the webinar, um, if you could give us the, your feedback, please. Um, so what's going to happen when the webinar closes, your uh, web browser will open up to, to a screen where we ask for your feedback. Could you please fill that in? And, uh, and just, uh, just, remember, just remember to uh, remind Jim and John about how clever they've been. Um, and you will also be getting an email that gives you the links for those items that I've mentioned to download the uh, accompanying files, and also your PD participation certificate. Um, we hope you've enjoyed this webinar and found it quite useful. We've covered a lot of areas here. Um, but uh, if you want to see more, I really encourage you to go to the uh, Australian New Zealand uh, Texas Instruments website, and that's where so much of this stuff can, uh, can just be downloaded. Um, the Student Centre, I know my students have been particularly using this for the exam exam readiness um, tutorials that are on there. They found that uh, tutorials and videos. They found that particularly useful, and and particularly some of the TNS files that they can keep on their calculator. Um, and where I teach, they're allowed to use them on their exams with files. Um, the Australian curriculum curriculum inspired part of the site. Absolutely wonderful. Very rich area of, of resources. Um, and there's more and more of that being built up at the moment. Uh, I'm in Victoria, so the, the VCE component of that that's being added in, it's, uh, that's very exciting when we saw some of that this evening. Um, and looking further afield, the whole activities exchange, the tests, uh, I've got, I'm lucky enough to have a navigator in my school and I've in fact used that test that John was just demonstrating. Um, the YouTube channel <coughs> is uh, ever increasing. <coughs> Excuse me. With um, with more and more useful videos there, um, <coughs> and of course face-to-face -face professional development activities. Uh, check the website for Learn Energize Connect PD events coming to a venue near you. Um, so once again, um, <coughs> thank you, Jim and John, for your expertise this evening, and I hope everyone's had. Um, uh, gained a lot of information from that. Good evening to all. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everyone.